I'm Preeti Taneja and I'm Director of the Newcastle Centre for Literary Arts and Professor of World Literature and Creative Writing here at Newcastle University. I'm here today to introduce Professor Sandeep Palmer, poet, critic and mentor. For many of you, she will need no introduction. You will have read her or learned from her via her foundational work on the Ledbury Poet Scheme, which trains critics of colour to take their place in contemporary culture. You will have been inspired, as I have, by her fearlessness and grateful for the precision with which she dissects the shame in literary culture. By shame, I am referring to its deep set racism and intersectional misogyny. Because of Professor Palmer, we can now name this, where naming makes a thing heard, visible, felt, and accountable as lyric violence. The damage of racism baked into syntax line break and stanza, emphasis and subject speaker, encoded through the Western lyric tradition, which spills into public life, unnoticed and or accepted, even celebrated. That violence is ubiquitous and the harms it does often glossed over. First, because it is tradition, but also because the bodies it co-ops into its heroic service are black and brown, and they must, as poets, as critics, and humans, find ways to survive in its oppressive and coercive shadow. With this in mind, and, a mean, and as a means of dispelling that shadow to create new spaces in which a more holistic and multitudinous country of the lyric might thrive, Professor Palmer takes the time also to consider how that shame articulates in her contemporaries' work both white and South Asian origin poets. She brings to her poetry and scholarship a unique compassion and insight we are lucky to have. Professor Palmer's lecture titled Motherhood, Whiteness and Empathy in Contemporary British Poetry reframes and takes forward this pioneering work. One might say that motherhood as physical reality, as metaphor and as collective action is a core principle of community, which is also the theme of this festival. It's a word and idea we can and must celebrate. It gives us a wonderful feeling to do so. But what does community actually mean to us? What does it require of us? As writers, as thinkers, audiences, curators and editors, making and taking in and reproducing culture, with these questions in mind, Professor Palmer's critical work and her words today could not be more relevant and more appropriate. What responsibility do we in our literary community have in society when the British state legislates to criminalise protest, to shut down the right to boycott or dissent through peaceful means, to expand stop and search powers and incorporate ever greater means of surveillance over we, citizens, while simultaneously shutting down any safe routes for vulnerable people seeking a dignified life in the UK. All of these examples disproportionately affect black and brown lives. That is the point of the hostile environment. Professor Palmer's work urgently asks us to consider how language, form, how voice, and how the lyric tradition itself, with its emphasis on the heroic individual, often white, more dangerous because of the sensitive empathies it lays claim to when female, might endlessly recreate that hostile environment in our community of poets and writers, even with the best of intentions to the contrary. Professor Palmer's work makes visible the harms of catharsis and the quest for absolution through singular confession that is rooted in the Christian tradition which underpins Western understandings of the lyric and the individual's self-journey to liberation. A community is a lesser thing without space in it for those courageous enough to hold its myths to the light, to question them with intellectual rigor, no matter how risky that might feel to the questioner or uncomfortable for the majority. If the literary community is to genuinely exist, Professor Palmer's work teaches us, it must be expansive enough to appreciate, celebrate, and laud multiple expressions of difference on their own terms through creativity, 
but also be mature enough to hear honestly and through criticism what can be refocused to true solidarity, an empathy that doesn't absolve, but urges whiteness and all within it to see, act, write, speak more and better. It takes courageous emancipatory determination as a poet of color, as a brown mother, as a South Asian British citizen whose sense of belonging is contingent always on the grace of the mainstream, and as a woman to decide to do this work publicly, yet it is a task that Professor Palmer does instinctively and superlatively. Without this work, a literary community, which I, trust in, always want to assume wishes to be a place of dignity for all, bound by an empathy that is as much critically humble, self-reflexive and self-aware as it is celebrative, could honestly call itself that. How does Professor Palmer do this important and difficult work? Alongside her three collections of poetry, The Marble Orchard, Idolon, and most recently, Faust, there is the pamphlet Threads, which proposes ways forward for a lyric that does not harm, and whose collective form, with Barney Kapil and Nisha Ramaya, is part of its politics. I must draw your attention to Professor Palmer's essay, Still Not a British Subject, Race and UK Poetry, the defining piece of a generation, marking a sea change in UK critical culture and its sense of culpability and accountability in the state of our public life. The piece had its first iteration in the LA Review of Books in 2015. The place of publication is significant. Dealing primarily with the British scene, still the work did not find a safe home here in the UK, but instead, after much effort, Palmer's own transatlantic histories, she's originally from Punjab, born in the UK and brought up in America, helped place it in that West Coast American magazine, silencing, as we know, a structural. As a writer who has experienced that silencing firsthand, and who shares Professor Palmer's Punjabi heritage and British birth, I cannot overstate how profoundly significant and affecting I find it to stand on this stage and reiterate how vital, in terms of survival, I find every line of Professor Palmer's work to be. In it, I find the core texts of the Western canon, from Ovid to Faust, via modernists Mina Loy and Nancy Cunard, held in critical community to make audible and visible the imperially ravaged bodies and lands of the Indian subcontinent and our diaspora. Specifically in Faust, she brings this to bear on the decimated wheat fields of Punjab, the breadbasket of India, so crucial to the world food supply. The cartographies of violence and of love Professor Palmer articulates in Faust include that of global capitalism's environmental damage, the heartbreak of and for Punjab's farmers facing suicide or ruin, the long ravages of political engendered shame on families and the land. Through her work, her unsurpassed knowledge of multiple traditions, languages and cultures are expressed in a syntactical intertextuality that becomes a lyrical politics. Hybridity is a spoken, lived and joyous critical position. Language distills almost to song, the songs of workers in fields, of women grieving our bodies, our histories, communally, over time, simply grieving. To put it lyrically, I, brown woman, read this book as a bringing into being of myself. I wept with relief and gratitude through every page. Through her body of work, Professor Palmer's voice is profoundly hopeful, her thinking abolitionist, a call to action, to decolonize not only our syllabuses, our, our statuary, but ourselves, to understand who we are, who we includes, who I centralizes, and how that damage can be undermined and reversed, so simply in a few lines from a poet and tradition that refuses to be made other to itself through the white gaze. To refuse to, as she writes, disregard our own violence done both by language and by the silences we allow. 
listening to her, reading her, walking with her among the barbarisms of history to critique our contemporary moment, is an invitation to together refuse that violence. And so I'm honored and proud to welcome her to Newcastle University and to invite her to take the stage. so much, Ruthie, for that um, incredible introduction, and it means so much coming from a writer like you, who I admire so much. Uh, thank you to the Newcastle Poetry Festival and also to the Royal Society of Literature. Nancy Cunyard saw herself unequivocally as an anti-fascist and anti-imperialist activist, publisher, editor, and of course, writer. And yet her fascination and obsession with blackness black bodies, culture, history, and artifacts was a product of her realizing her own whiteness and aristocratic privilege. She once credited her romance with the African-American jazz musician Henry Crowder with a kind of race awakening. Her already radical politics from then on naturally converged with anti-racism. Still, her very ostensible act of political bravery or social justice is matched by a sometimes private, sometimes public, and one might argue of her time, deployment of primitivist and essentialist racist categories. Cunard's foregrounding of self, even pictorially in African carved wood and ebony bangles, her white and increasingly frail body superimposed on scenes of racial violence past and present, is not only a failure of empathy, but a failure to interrogate one's own seeing, a false consciousness she cultivated to survive. Cunard's problematic co-opting of racial imagery was visually important to her. The bracelets she regularly wore up to her elbows, photographs like this one, if we can get the next slide. Oh, it's there. Uh, taken by Barbara Kersimer of Cunard prone and in bondage, exposed in negative to black in her skin. Her rejection of whiteness and her allegiances to African, Caribbean, and black American racial struggles have been read as rooted from an early childhood fantasy. In her memoir of Norman Douglas, she writes, and this is the next slide. At about six years old, my thoughts began to be drawn toward Africa and particularly towards the Sahara. Surely I was being taught as much about El Dorado and the North Pole. But there it was, the desert, the sand, the dunes, the huge spaces, mirages, heat, and parchedness. I seemed able to visualize all of this. Of such were filled several dreams, culminating in the great nightmare in which I wandered repeatedly the whole of one agonizing night, escaping through a series of tents somewhere in the Sahara. Later came extraordinary dreams about black Africa, the dark continent, where Af with Africans dancing and drumming around me, and I, one of them, though still white, knowing mysteriously enough how to dance in their own manner. Everything was full of movement in these dreams. It was that which enabled me to escape in the end, going further, even further. And all of it was mixed with a mixture of apprehension that sometimes turned into joy and even rapture. What does this image fulfill with its mix of apprehension and rapture? Cunard's African landscape is unpeopled initially. It is a sea of sand, an endlessly iterative, undulating space, an unbordered, uncivilized, shifting openness accompanied by darkness, which she refers to as Black Africa. Introduce time, an agonizing night, and later figures of Africans dancing and drumming, and her inescapable nightmare becomes instead a freeing, anonymizing rhythm, an intensely satisfying belonging, through communal movement and deferral of recognition and self-consciousness. In a poem dedicated to the Trinidadian poet Alfred Cruikshank, Cunard explained her energetic fight against imperialism in the West Indies by proposing, maybe I was an African one time. But what does Africa mean to Cunard? She was knowledgeable enough about the variety of African art to catalog it accurately even helping to establish Liverpool Museum's considerable collections in the 1950s, and was towards the end of her life working on a book about African art. 
And yet, once frustrated by Crowder, she apparently exhorted him to be more African. To which he replied, I ain't African, I'm American. In her foreword to her 1934 Negro anthology, Kinard poses this very question, what is Africa? Her conclusion is that Africa is a tragedy. Cunard's sense of Africa and those of African origin, estranged generations before by forced migration, is entirely reduced and implicated into her own fantasy escape across borders and her rejection of the Western imperialist culture she sees as illegitimate that is her own origin. It feels important to acknowledge a wider framework of whiteness before I focus my attention today specifically on white womanhood, lyric, motherhood, and empathy. Like Cunard, Elizabeth Bishop's imagination was animated by racial otherness and likewise by non-human subjects. Several scholars have engaged with race and class and gender in Bishop's writing about her years living in Brazil and the subject of African Americans. I am interested in the formal question of what I term lyric violence, namely, that which reproduces repressive systemic power unconsciously through a white literary imagination. Simply put, lyric violence occurs when the assumption of a lyric speaker's universality or neutrality goes unchecked. In this space of address, which historically and culturally objectifies anything other than white, male, heteronormative points of view, violence occurs when the disappearance of the speaker into the universal raises the prominence of the addressee who is meant to stand in as a projection of the speaker's interior life. This violence, a function of an unimplicated observer, removes agency from the addressee by instrumentalizing their perceived otherness, effectively diminishing their voice within the lyric space to produce a fantasy for the reader. The best known example of racialized fantasy from Bishop's oeuvre would likely be her poem in The Waiting Room. Through scenes of lyric violence, though, sorry, though scenes lyric of lyric violence recur throughout her work. Little Elizabeth Bishop's realization of herself as an eye in the horrifying breasts of black women photographed in the National Geographic, as well as the imagined cry of her aunt Consuelo, draws the poem speaker into the dizzying weight of her existence. It both destabilizes the self and reconstitutes it in the, in the present. It solidifies it in a moment of individuation. Blackness and black bodies either jar or invite horror in the lyric space throughout Bishop's work, but they always function to define the speaker's vulnerability and whiteness. Repeatedly, the violences of colonialism, segregation, and racism, the effects of displacement, othering, and repression, become a vehicle for Bishop's lyric violence to create a place of rupture, a site of abjection, so that the dominant, detached, and universal lyric eye can come to know and understand its own fragmented outsiderness, but largely at a cost to others. In Cameron Javadizadeh's reading of Claudia Rankin's Citizen in relation to Robert Lowell's life studies, Javadizadeh points to the presumed whiteness of the expressive post-romantic lyric subject and its autobiographical confessional turn. Borrowing Lowell's oft-repeated line from the poem Epilogue, yet why not say what happened? Java Dissaday argues that it is harder after all to say what happened when the sovereignty of the subject, the whom that what happened had happened to, had been called into question, when the poet itself was thought of not as an internally coherent reservoir of Wordsworthian memory, but instead as a linguistically and therefore, in Rankin's view, socially and politically, contingent and shifting site. In a 2007 essay, Major Jackson critiques the white contemporary American poet's propensity towards stereotypes of violence, threat, and animality in depictions of what he calls racial encounters with black people. While Jackson claims lyric poetry allows us to inhabit the consciousness of others, it is clear from his analysis that white poets rarely wish to address what he terms race relations or the color line, in essence, race and racism in America. Kaya Chingani more recently takes up Jackson's use of the racial encounter to read poems by Claire Pollard, where white female vulnerability is given voice in such encounters. He writes, 
The unwillingness of the poet to soft pedal the prejudice of the speakers in the poems shows us the insecurities at the heart of structural whiteness, the insecurities that have been used historically to justify racial separatism as a matter arising from biological fact related to the natural order of things. It seems to me that Jackson is right, and we cannot make headway in the Republic of Letters or anywhere else unless we are willing to put all of our cards on the table to write into and through our prejudices and to make a space in the work for meaningful critique. Even more recently, Andrea Brady asks, what can readings in the history of lyric and its critics tell us about the forms whiteness takes? By which I mean not only its historical violence, but also what Cheryl Harris calls the common premise whiteness shares with property, a right to exclude. Lyric as a mode of enclosure, a protected domain of formal expectation and constraint, determines by the very nature of its linguistic artifice of universality, its construction of a neutral observer, the premise for violence and exclusion. Fiona Sampson, in her book on Lyric, edges towards a liberal pluralistic resolution of Lyric's contested linguistic terrain. She writes, that poets with a genuinely international or minority cultural background of their own do, simply by naming what's characteristic or feels significant in that background, enlarge English language culture. These enlargements are interesting poetically as well as culturally, since they heighten the shared vocabulary of both word and image. But the particularities of racial or cultural experiences beyond whiteness are not unilaterally transferable without those poets, and generally here poets of color, becoming the vehicles for exoticizing themselves for a shared vocabulary, in which inequality and systemic whiteness remains unaccountable and unexamined. Samson's implication here is presumably that expressive lyrics codified self-referentiality makes space for cross-cultural understanding, leading, in the ideal case, to empathy. What then are the limits of empathy in the lyric poem, and what relationship might the dynamics of the lyric, as expressive and enclosed, have with structural and sentimental whiteness? In Scenes of Subjection, Sadia Hartman considers an emotional account written by a white man, John Rankin, of witnessing a coffle of enslaved people. She writes that Rankin begins to feel for himself rather than for those whom this exercise in imagination presumably is designed to reach by making the slave's suffering his own. The ease of Rankin's empathic identification is as much due to his good intentions and heartfelt opposition to slavery as to the fungibility of the captive body. Can the white witness of the spectacle of suffering affirm the materiality of the black sentience only by feeling for himself? Does this not only exacerbate the idea that black sentience is inconceivable and unimaginable, but in the very ease of possessing the abased and enslaved body, ultimately allied in understanding and acknowledgement of the slave's pain? Hartman goes on to say that there is a thin line between the witness and the spectator. Rankin positions his white body in the place of a black body to make his own spectator suffering visible and intelligible. The ambivalent character of empathy, more exactly the repressive effects of empathy, as Jonathan Boyerin notes, can be lo located in the obliteration of otherness, or the facile intimacy that enables identification with the other only as we feel ourselves into those we imagine as ourselves. Hartman refers to this as the violence of identification. Put simply, the body of the enslaved other is further commodified by its usefulness as a vehicle for the suffering of those who have power over it. Walt Hunter concurs in his reading of lyric and globalization in the contemporary. To follow in the line of Hartman's thought instead, the very premise, the very idea of a bourgeois lyric subject is made possible by the existence of a lyric object, the commodified human, the Atlantic slave trade, and the ongoing racialized violence necessary for the continuation of capitalism. In the hands of whiteness, particularly here, white womanhood and motherhood, what are the limits of empathy? Is lyric empathy in the racial encounter a disruptive maneuver, a radical political gesture, or a purposeful means of blurring the lines between lyric subject and addressee 
Or is it merely a recognition and a reinforcement of otherness, whiteness, and estrangement? Without at all wishing to draw attention in my discussion here of three contemporary British poets to the poets themselves, my intention is instead to focus on how their lyric subjects are constructed as speaking and witnessing in the realm of lyric violence, empathy, and indeed the abject. In many ways, whiteness constructs itself in absence, invisibly, as the universal. But in the case of white women, particularly cis, heterosexual, middle-class women, the invocation of femininity functions within a patriarchal order, as, and we know this almost instinctually, though history bears this up, to counterpoint and underwrite male authority and power. Race in Britain is indivisible from its imperial past, and by extension, I would argue that the figuration of white womanhood in colonial and post-colonial contexts gives us some insight into the dynamics of racial encounter back in the heart of its empire even today. Jenny Sharp has argued that racialization occurred when threats to imperial rule were transmuted into threats against English women's safety in the colonial space. English women thereby become the apex and rationale for the civilizing forces of empire. In her study of novels by Forster Bronte and Paul Scott's The Jewel in the Crown, Sharp returns to tropes of violation and rape in literary representations of the British Raj. She writes that a crisis in British authority is managed through the circulation of violated bodies of English women as a sign for the violation of colonialism. English womanhood emerges as an important cultural signifier for articulating a colonial hierarchy of race. Sharp's readings are mindful of the contingencies of categories of gender and race within a complex and evolving framework in which white women wielded little actual power but were invoked to justify violent acts. What we are left with is not a representative speaking subject necessarily, but one for whom agency sits within the dominance over the subordinates. In other words, white womanhood and empire was detached, domestic, virtuous, and highly symbolic of the authority of the crown. On April 10th, 1919, in Amritsar, a 45-year-old superintendent of the city mission schools and a Church of England missionary named Miss Marcella, Marcella Sherwood was knocked from her bicycle and nearly beaten to death by Indians rioting against the arrests of two political resistance leaders. The events of the week that followed are well documented. The massacre at Jalimanabagh three days later, ordered by General Reginald Dyer's forces, left hundreds if not thousands dead, including women and children. An inquiry was called months later. Dyer's actions were, actions were deemed disproportionate, but he was lauded as the savior of British rule in Punjab by many in England. However, the response to Sherwood's attack is perhaps less well known. A so-called crawling order was put in place on the street where Sherwood fell. Anyone passing was required to go down on all fours or, as was actually the case, crawl on their bellies exactly like reptiles. His rationale was that, as many Indians crawl face downwards in front of their gods, I wanted them to know what a white British woman is, sorry, that a white British woman is as sacred as a Hindu god, and therefore they have to crawl in front of her too. The spectacle of humiliation combined with mandatory salams to British officers and flogging posts at both ends of the street went beyond punishment to a deeper psychological message about white womanhood, which is sanctified by the protection of, but also for, the protection of the state. Again, the vulnerable white female body, both elevated symbolically and denigrated materially, occupies a chief concern, as well as a useful tool for the totalizing forces of state power. The crawling order speaks also to the enactment and enforcement of humiliating racial abjection. The abject, as we have observed in Bishop's and Cunard's poems, is that which threatens the stability of the self, the self's ability to mediate between itself and the world. It is a source of horror, like those terrifying breasts that lie in wait for Bishop's child speaker in her metaphorical waiting room. In the work of Julia Kristeva, the, abs the abject is considered, 
that which makes differentiation possible from the maternal, body, maternal bodily abyss, but that also pulls us back, causes us to recoil, because it is both ourself and not ourself. In her book, Strangers to Ourselves, Kristeva extends a version of abjection to the racial encounter within national borders, in essence, to the negotiating of minority migrants within national life. Although Kristeva's book does not really consider racism or empire in any meaningful way, I am drawn to the link between abjection and the stranger. Noelle McAfee reads Kristeva thus, Before the foreigner, the native recalls her own incompleteness. She becomes anxious. The body that becomes anxious is both the personal body of the native and the political body of the nation. The foreigner threatens the borders of the symbolic and national order. McAfee notes importantly that Kristeva never overtly links the abject with the stranger, but that the foreigner is the return of the abject, our encounter with nothing, an encounter with the other within us. I will now turn to three poems in which racial encounters speak to both the lyric positioning of the white woman as empathetic subject and the abject stranger within to attempt to understand where empathy roots itself in its encounter with the other. Kim Moore's collection, All the Men I Never Married, is comprised of a series of numbered poems, each engaging with violence or misogyny, each a lyrical feminist indictment of the mistreatment of women and girls. A series of these, published in Mal Journal prior to Moore's book, includes a poem, number 21, that does not appear in the final collection. The content of the poem forms its own rationale for exclusion. It does not explicitly detail the aforementioned misogyny, or at least the violence in this poem is not directed towards the female body, but narrates an instance of racist assault. What I find interesting about this poem is both its content and its form. As a lyric event, the poem contains both the recollection of an attack and an elder, wiser speaker who interprets its witnessing from the distance of many years. This extension of lyric time, of expression across a gradual realization, the interpretation of a socially mature and critical self, recurs elsewhere in Moore's collection and is the continuous subjective voice that makes social critique possible throughout the book. And I think we have a slide. I won't read the poem. Returning to the racial encounter, I would reiterate that there are two overlapping frames producing the poem's lyric subject. One is a childhood self, whose singularity is communal, rarely indistinct from the cruelty of school children, generally who are indeterminate subjects conditioned by the innocence or ignorance of a majority white schoolyard. Indeed, the poem ends with the lines, that school was full of cruelty, we had it drummed into us, not to see race, to pretend it wasn't there, taught to imagine his hair out of existence. The other is socially conditioned to see race, or to at least know that it is determined by racial difference, though I would argue that its apprehension of whiteness is purely relational and does not go as far as to name itself. The vagaries of memory foreground the speaker's emotional state. It may have just been a clumsy tackle, we are told. But here is also an admission of culpability or at least complicity in the round. The boy's shame is unforgettable as he gathers his hair and his babka in with an expert movement, as is the teacher's gesture brushing away something unclean. We are told that the teacher is not an unkind man as he snaps at the boy to go sort yourself out as if he dropped his pants or worse. As I think is already evident, the lyricized racial encounter naturally polarizes around the spectator who perceives the other as a vehicle for the articulation of their own inner emotions. The shock of the boy's hair is a vis visceral shock to the speaker. His body is co-opted and the boy remains voiceless in the poem and without redress. The speaker speculates whether they are exoticizing him or looking back with embellishment, but there is no outstretched hand here of address, no move towards a discursive acknowledgement of his interiority. It is enough for the speaker to know, to learn now as an adult looking back, the proper names drawn from Sikh scripture for the five distinguishing features of its adherents, 
Does this help make space for the history needed to ground the encounter in the objectivity that would turn an observation about the boy's girl hair into what is quite the opposite? The Gesh and Barka symbols of self-defense, of masculine power and war. By reading the boy's vulnerability as female or feminized, the lyric subject misreads or indeed misinterprets through a racialized lens of whiteness the position of the other as weak, inferior, thus imbibing the patriarchal and imperial order on which structural whiteness is founded. The apprehension of the right vocabulary here forms an uncomfortable distance between the child spectator and the adult speaker, where knowledge merely sharpens a lens of whiteness, of racial difference, in service of the speaker's emotional state, but does not make empathy towards another in any way possible. The unkind or kind teacher, depending on who you are in the scene, and a racially homogenous education has not ultimately taught the children to imagine his hair out of existence, but it has done the work of making the humiliated boy abject for no reason other than the anxiety it conjures in the white speaker. We might consider here the interpretation of Freud's concept of dynamic transference as a lyric mode, described in Noir Sadir's fourth person singular, as a lyric address that occurs not only between an I and a you, but separate parts of the mind and different states of self. In her application of transference to the lyric, we use our expectations of how people or versions of ourselves we've known well have responded in the past as an index when anticipating how the person before us will respond in the present. The self-consciousness of addressing a past self in Moore's poem services the lyric subject and its dialogue with the reader but does little by way of activating empathy for the abjected object of the poem situation. Fiona Benson's poem, Mosquitoes Mozambique, is one in a series of insect love songs, most recently published in her collection, Ephemeron. A complex racial dynamic is navigated by a lyric speaker who employs flashes of self-awareness, most especially the poem's final, and I think ambivalent line, I do not deserve this life. This life might specifically be as one of a group of NGO workers in Africa who are united by a collective itch under the collective wine of mosquitoes, possibly transmitting malaria, or it might be one who has the freedom to leave at will. One way to read this poem and its lyric subject position is to empathize with the I, who is paranoid and terrorized by the thought of being bitten and infected she is one of the mosquitoes' chosen ones. We are told mosquitoes prefer blondes and restless sleepers. Towards the end of the poem, the speaker fears she has contracted the disease. The vulnerability of the speaker's body to the invasive insect's proboscis is underpinned earlier by the revelation also that the speaker has no children, but has miscarried and so holds herself like a crystal glass full to the brim, afraid to spill, afraid to harm a single ovum. The repetition and rhythm in both excerpts are indeed panicked and feverish. Afraid, afraid, back, 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 form an uneasy or perhaps uneasy pairing. Likewise, the sonic resonance of aisle and ills that reverberates through the rest of the poem into a wish for providence, protection, and a will that is willing and able to give whatever it takes from whoever to live. As the speaker situates herself within a mass of much more vulnerable bodies than her own, she handles herself both with fierce protectiveness and detachment. When I am feverish, I take myself to the hospital and cue to have my finger pricked in the whitewashed clinic. Like the crystal glass that holds itself, the subject takes, that takes itself is the person for whom life is another reality beyond the endemic disease and death wards that surround her. It is, in this sense, the unreal, almost derealized state of being abjected by defilement disease, but is in no way a real threat to existence. Whereas the white male body and lyric subject represents both humanist universality and authority, the bodies of white women subsume the vulnerabilities of others into a subjective state of hypervigilant vulnerability and threat. Whiteness describes those for whom the full range of emotional life is possible. 
And in this poem, Benson's Africans are, like Bishop's figures of blackness, sites of horror. The man driven insane by dysentery, turmeric yellow shit dribbling down his leg, or a dying girl, child, honesty's daughter, whose death is an animalistic spectacle of exorcism, followed by the line, it makes me sick to write this as if I make it happen, but every two minutes, a child. I'm reminded again of Sadia Hartman's work cited above on empathy and its failures of the spectacle of black death and suffering. All of this alongside the nobility and saintliness of white scientists, the merciful professor Imo Hansen, and one in London who commits a kind of positive eugenics on a species of mosquito. There will be infertile males, and in eight generations, a matter of days, the brood will collapse. The eradication of a vector of disease through language akin to population control will not be lost on many readers, nor will the white body as a, quote, welcome mat, fail to conjure up metonymically and metaphorically the paranoia of reversed post-imperial migration. In my final reading, I briefly turn to Hannah Sullivan's poem, Tenants. The first of three long poems from her collection was it for this. Pivoting then from the abject as a heightened space of otherness, as the self in tension with a non-self, to abjection and motherhood. Simplifying Kristeva's thinking on the origins of abjection, the maternal body as the original site of being, which the child must differentiate from in order to find subjectivity, is central to the fear or horror that the abject brings. If we then extend this to the threatened self that is Kristeva's native, the foreign body too represents a threat to the borders of the known self, is a kind of elsewhere that destabilizes. How might we connect the maternal abject and the abjection of the stranger within and the concepts of empathy and ethics? Although Sullivan's poem, Tenants, is ostensibly focused on the burning of Grenfell Tower in London in the early hours of June 14, 2017, its scope is much wider and indeed foregrounds itself in the voice of a mother observing the tragedy of Grenfell from her own relative position of racial, social, and economic privilege. Although the poem is in essence time and date stamped by the first 999 call, it hearkens a self-awareness of the possibilities of lyric itself to contain a moment. And this is a quote from the beginning. To think of an event, a thing that happened, to understand how vague it was, how confused, uneventful, out of time. Rather than begin with the fire breaking out, the poem maps the terrain historically and personally through the eyes of a new mother whose residence is not Grenfell, but in a more affluent area of the starkly divided borough of Chelsea and Kensington. We are told that the children's playground in Holland Park has had a million pound refurbishment, but looks much the same. How small life is when your entire focus contracts to raising a newborn. The lyric subject establishes its subject position, its concerns, trains its seeing, fixes on its own body, so that by the time the fire begins, we're in little doubt that this particular subject is close enough to watch the spectacle unfold, but far enough physically and materially to be unaffected by its danger. Add to this the aestheticizing of the pain of others, of its apprehension through the white female mothering body, that is both abjection and estrangement working together as a failure of empathy. Some of you will be familiar with the now infamous painting of Emmett Till, the black teenager falsely accused by a white woman uh, and lynched in 1955. The white artist Dana Schutz justified her decision to paint Till in his coffin thus. I don't know what it is like to be black in America, but I do know what it is like to be a mother. Emmett was Mamie Till's only son. The thought of anything happening to your child is beyond comprehension. Their pain is your pain. My engagement with this image was through empathy with his mother. Art can be a space for empathy, a vehicle for connection. I don't believe that people can ever really know what it is like to be someone else. I will never know the fear that black parents may have, but neither are we all completely unknowable. Schutt's painting of Till's face is blurred. Some would argue his brutalized body re-disfigured. The artist's empathy with Mamie Till distorts our collective memory of the photograph 
an image which Till's mother insisted be shown, and hence why it has come to be, rightly, an indictment of white supremacy and an unending cycle of racist violence. What interests me here, for the purposes of my reading of Sullivan's poem, is that motherhood, like whiteness, is seen as a universal, universalizing collective gaze, not one that points to that violence, but one that in instead focalizes on maternal grief. As if race, or indeed class, etc., is secondary to the experience of motherhood. As if motherhood stands in for a common and indivisible humanity immured to the particularities of different lives and subjectivities. The facts on maternal and infant mortality alone demonstrate that we mother differently, even before our children are born, under the domain of an unequal state that sees racialized bodies as disposable. In Cynthia Dewey Arca's essay, Motherhood, Mothering as Revolutionary Praxis, she writes that women of color have not produced equally valued members of the labor force under the global capitalist regime where white children are celebrated as increased human capital, black, indigenous, and third world children are lamented as drains on state resources, prospective criminals, and more recently with the racist overpopulation discourse as perpetrators of environmental degradation. The speaker's baby, the quotidian challenges of early motherhood, the cosmopolitan nursing in the French patisserie, the mind-numbing boredom of it all, these things sit uneasily alongside the refracted and borrowed language from the Grenfell Inquiry Report and the language of 999 calls and witness testimonies. I am struck by a few contra contrasts, the recurrence of words like black and white and why and where they appear. Also by the prevalence of foreignness, often signaled by food, and the aestheticizing of the disaster, which is possibly inevitable. The tower is described as a blackened shell or husk, a blackened skeleton, a mausoleum, our disgrace. These are headlines that swiftly shift to a subjective individual view, at first in the present, then cast back in time searchingly for any likenesses. There it is. The terse public language of collective shock, shame, or possibly accountability as yet unfulfilled gives way to a recurring blackness elsewhere blackberries, then mascara, then Greek widows selling fish seen on holiday once. I am drawn to the expensiveness and frivolity of the similes, even the acute finery of the frames of reference, a feathery boa, lace, metalwork, a rural hedgeland, where one might forage at leisure. I am also drawn to the hints of discardedness that multiply in the husbandless and presumably poor and elderly women just sitting inert lifeless as the fish on the slab. If new death is onyx or pearl, semi-precious, its value can only be assessed by those who know its value. Elsewhere, the objective maternal postpartum body understands its lochia secretions as the texture of a custard dim sum bun. Likewise, the inhabitants of the tower pickling limes in aubergine or saffron crumbling in the stewing fish or a doorway smelling of lamb and cumin are there to remind the reader of the presence or absence of non-white bodies by a sort of olfactory racism. If the maternal body becomes foreign to itself through pregnancy and birth, as Christina suggests, harboring otherness, then the horror of recognizing foreignness within national boundaries as destabilizing to our sense of self is doing the double work of abjection in Sullivan's imagery. The eye ultimately moves away from the blackened out flat where it all started, finally to the, quote, incandescence in the gardens, the sprinklers turning in the garden squares, reminding us that the social order, the enclosures of privilege, remain unchanged. In an essay accompanying Steve McQueen's 24-minute film, Grenfell, Paul Gilroy explains that the deaths of those in the tower were entirely preventable. He writes that, the familiar pathologies of power, greed, corruption, and indifference were augmented by the colonial mentality of the local state and its various proxies, intermediaries, and henchpeople. Given the economic and ethnic makeup of those who lived and perished in the tower, one might legitimately see the Grenfell disaster as the result of the long shadow of colonialism and racism enacted in the present day 
by the unmovable belief that the bodies of brown and black people are less valuable and worthy of protection than white ones. Sullivan's poem is moving, especially in moments where we hear the voices of distress, where they break through the mundane and almost willfully irrelevant details of the speaker's life. As a vehicle of empathy, I believe they tell us more about the speaker than they do about the suffering and death they mean to convey. Quite possibly, the radical disconnection, the superfluousness of, white, of middle, whiteness and middle-class motherhood, stands in here to demonstrate the impossibility of empathy, to show that empathizing without colonizing the suffering that can never be their own, especially if one benefits from the very systems that oppress others, is beyond our national imagination for now. As Adrian Rich writes, I believe that white feminists today raised white in a racist society are often ridden, ridden with white solipsism, not the consciously held belief that one race is inherently superior to all others, but a tunnel vision which simply does not see non-white experience or existence as precious or significant, unless in spasmodic, impotent guilt reflexes which have little or no long-term continuing momentum or political usefulness. Without radical political action, the ambivalence and solipsism of lyric subjectivity, its false claims to empathy, its witness without investment, its framing of the other as one and itself, the emotional and expressive forms, an empty ritual, one made incomplete by the knowledge that upending structures of power, even formal, textual manifestations of lyric <coughs> coherence would necessitate a loss of such power for themselves, however complicit or compromised by their own struggles against patriarchal violence. Thank you.